Everybody dies, don't they? Everybody Some come back, don't they? Isn't that Everybody so? Back, you tried to get into the locked drawer so? today, didn't you? you tried How do the dead come, come back, Mother? What's the secret? Thurnley Abbey, written by Percival Landon and narrated by Tony Walker. Three years ago, I was on my way out to the east, and, as an extra day in London was of some importance, I took the Friday evening mail train to Brindisi instead of the usual Thursday morning Marseille Express. Many people shrink from the long 48-hour train journey through Europe and the subsequent rush across the Mediterranean on the 19-knot Isis or Osiris, but there is really very little discomfort on either the train or the mail boat, and unless there is actually nothing for me to do, I always like to save the extra day and a half in London before I say goodbye to her for one of my longer tramps. This time it was early, I remember, in the shipping season, probably about the beginning of September. There were few passengers, and I had a compartment in the P&O Indian Express to myself all the way from Calais. All Sunday I watched the blue waves dimpling the Adriatic, and the pale rosemary along the cuttings, the plain white towns with their flat roofs and their bold duomos, and the grey-green gnarled olive orchards of Apulia. The journey was just like any other. We ate in the dining car as often and as long as we decently could. We slept after luncheon. We dawdled the afternoon away with yellow-backed novels. Sometimes we exchanged platitudes in the smoking room, and it was there that I met Alistair Colvin. Colvin was a man of middle height, with a resolute well-cut jaw. His hair was turning grey, his moustache was sun-whitened, otherwise he was clean-shaven, obviously a gentleman, and obviously also a preoccupied man. He had no great wit, but when spoken to he made the usual remarks in the right way, and I dare say he refrained from banalities only because he spoke less than the rest of us. Most of the time he buried himself in the Wagon Lee Company's timetable, but seemed unable to concentrate his attention on any one page of it. He found that I had been over the Siberian Railway, and for a quarter of an hour he discussed it with me. Then he lost interest in it, and rose to go to his compartment. But he came back again very soon, and seemed glad to pick up the conversation again. Of course, this did not seem to me to be of any importance. Most travellers by train become a trifle infirm of purpose after thirty-six hours rattling. But Colvin's restless way I noticed in somewhat marked contrast with the man's personal importance and dignity. Especially ill-suited was it to his finely made large hand with strong, broad, regular nails and its few lines. As I looked at his hand, I noticed a long, deep, and recent scar of ragged shape. However, it is absurd to pretend that I thought anything was unusual. I went off at five o'clock on Sunday afternoon to sleep away the hour or two that had still to be got through before we arrived at Brindisi. Once there, we few passengers transshipped our hand baggage, verified our berths, there were only a score of us all in all, and then, after an aimless ramble of half an hour in Brindisi, we returned to dinner at the Hotel International, not wholly surprised that the town had been the death of Virgil. If I remember rightly, there is a gaily painted hall at the International. I do not wish to advertise anything, but there is no other place in Brindisi at which to await the coming of the mails. And after dinner, I was looking with awe at a trellis overgrown with blue vines, when Colvin moved across the room to my table. He picked up Il Secolo, but almost immediately gave up the pretense of reading it. He turned squarely to me and said, Would you do me a favour? One doesn't do favours to stray acquaintances on Continental Expresses without knowing something more of them than I knew of Colvin. But I smiled in a non-committal way and asked him what he wanted. I wasn't wrong in part of my estimate of him. He said bluntly, Will you let me sleep in your cabin on the Osiris? And he coloured a little as he said it. Now, there is nothing more tiresome than having to put up with a stable companion at sea, and I asked him rather pointedly, Surely there's room for all of us? 
I thought that perhaps he had been partnered off with some mangy Levantine, and wanted to escape from him at all hazards. Colvin, still somewhat confused, said, Yes, I'm in a cabin by myself, but you would do me the greatest favour if you would allow me to share yours. This was all very well, but beside the fact that I always sleep better when alone, there had been some recent thefts on board English liners, and I hesitated. Frank and honest and self-conscious as Colvin was. Just then the mail train came in with a clatter and a rush of escaping steam, and I asked him to see me again about it on the boat when we started. He answered me curtly. I suppose he saw the mistrust in my manner. I am a member of White's. I smiled to myself as he said it, but I remembered in a moment that the man, if he were really what he claimed to be, and I make no doubt that he was, must have been sorely put to it before he urged the fact as a guarantee of his respectability to a total stranger at a Brindisi hotel. That evening, as we cleared the red and green harbour lights of Brindisi, Colvin explained. This is his story, in his own words. When I was travelling in India some years ago, I made the acquaintance of a youngish man in the woods and forests. We camped out together for a week, and I found him a pleasant companion. John Broughton was a light-hearted soul when off duty, but a steady and capable man in any of the small emergencies that continually arise in that department. He was liked and trusted by the natives, and though a trifle over-pleased with himself when he escaped to civilization at Simla or Calcutta, Broughton's future was well assured in government service when a fair-sized estate was unexpectedly left to him, and he joyfully shook the dust of the Indian plains from his feet and returned to England. For five years he drifted about London. I saw him now and then. We dined together about every eighteen months, and I could trace pretty exactly the gradual sickening of Broughton with a merely idle life. He then set out on a couple of long voyages, who returned as restless as before, and at last told me that he had decided to marry and settle down at his place, Thurnley Abbey, which had long been empty. He spoke about looking after the property and standing for his constituency in the usual way. Vivian Wilde, his fiancée, had, I suppose, begun to take him in hand. She was a pretty girl, with a deal of fair hair and a rather exclusive manner, deeply religious in a narrow school. She was still kindly and high-spirited, and I thought that Broughton was in luck. He was quite happy and full of information about his future. Among other things, I asked him about Thurnley Abbey. He confessed that he hardly knew the place. The last tenant, a man called Clark, had lived in one wing for fifteen years and seen no one. He had been a miser and a hermit. It was the rarest thing for a light to be seen in the Abbey after dark. Only the barest necessities of life were ordered. And the tenant himself received them at the side door. His one half-caste manservant, after a month's stay in the house, had abruptly left without warning and had returned to the southern states. One thing Broughton complained bitterly about, Clark had willfully spread the rumour among the villages that the Abbey was haunted and had even consented to play childish tricks with spirit lamps and salt in order to scare trespassers away at night. He had been detected in the act of his tomfoolery, but the story spread and no one, said Broughton, would venture near the house except in broad daylight. The hauntedness of Fernley Abbey was now, he said with a grin, part of the gospel of the countryside, but he and his young wife were going to change all that. Would I propose myself any time I liked? I, of course, said I would, and equally, of course, intended to do nothing of the sort without a definite invitation. House was put in thorough repair, though not a stick of the old furniture and tapestry were removed. Floors and ceilings were relaid, the roof was made watertight again, and the dust of half a century was scoured out. He showed me some photographs of the place. It was called an abbey, though, as a matter of fact, it had only been the infirmary of the long-vanished abbey of Kloster, some five miles away. The larger part of this building remained as it had been in pre-Reformation days, but a wing had been added in Jacobean times, and that part of the house had been kept in something like repair by Mr. Clark. 
He had in both the ground and first floors set a heavy timber door, strongly barred with iron, in the passage between the earlier and the Jacobean parts of the house, and had entirely neglected the former, so there had been a good deal of work to be done. Broughton, whom I saw in London two or three times about this period, made a deal of fun over the positive refusal of the workmen to remain after sundown. Even after the electric light had been put into every room, nothing would induce them to remain, though, as Broughton observed, electric light was death on ghosts. The legend of the Abbey's ghosts had gone far and wide, and the men would take no risks. They went home in batches of five and six, and even during the daylight hours there was an inordinate amount of talking between one and another, if either happened to be out of sight of his companion. On the whole, though, nothing of any sort or kind had been conjured up even by their heated imaginations during their five months' work upon the Abbey. The belief in ghosts was rather strengthened than otherwise in Thurnley because of the men's confessed nervousness, and local tradition declared itself in favour of the ghost of an immured nun. "'Good old nun,' said Broughton. I asked him whether in general he believed in the possibility of ghosts, and, rather to my surprise, he said that he couldn't say he entirely disbelieved in them. A man in India had told him one morning in camp that he believed that his mother was dead in England, as her vision had come to his tent the night before. He had not been alarmed, but had said nothing, and then the figure vanished again. As a matter of fact, the next possible Dakwala brought on a telegram announcing the mother's death. There the thing was, said Broughton, but at Thurnley he was practical enough. He roundly cursed the idiotic selfishness of Clark, whose silly antics had caused all the inconvenience. At the same time, he couldn't refuse to sympathise, to some extent, with the ignorant workman. My own idea, said he, is that if a ghost ever does come in one's way, we ought to speak to it. I agreed. Little as I knew of the ghost world and its conventions, I had always remembered that a spook was in honour bound to wait to be spoken to. It didn't seem much to do, and I felt that the sound of one's own voice would at any rate reassure oneself as to one's wakefulness. But there are few ghosts outside Europe, few, that is, that any white man can see, and I have never been troubled with any. However, as I have said, I told Broughton that I agreed. So the wedding took place, and I went to it in a tall hat which I bought for the occasion, and the new Mrs. Broughton smiled very nicely at me afterwards. As it had to happen, I took the Orient Express that evening, and was not in England again for nearly six months. Just before I came back, I got a letter from Broughton. He asked if I could come to see him in London, or come to Thurnley, as he thought I should be better able to help him than anyone else he knew. His wife sent a nice message to me at the end, so I was reassured about at least one thing. I wrote from Budapest that I would come and see him at Thurnley two days after my arrival in London, and as I sauntered out of the Pannonia into the Carepesi Utsa to post my letters, I wondered of what earthly service I could be to Broughton. I had been out with him after Tiger on foot, and I could imagine few men better able at a pinch to manage their own business. However, I had nothing to do, so after dealing with some small accumulations of business during my absence, I packed a kit bag and departed to Euston. I was met by Broughton's great limousine at Thurnley Road Station, and after a drive of nearly seven miles, we echoed through the sleepy streets of Thurnley Village, into which the main gates of the park thrust themselves, splendid with pillars and spread eagles and tomcats rampant atop of them. I never was a herald, but I know that the Broughtons have the right to supporters. Heaven knows why. From the gates, a quadruple avenue of beech trees led inwards for a quarter of a mile. Beneath them, a neat strip of fine turf edged the road and ran back until the poison of the dead beech leaves killed it under the trees. There were many wheel tracks on the road, and a comfortable little pony trap jogged past me, laden with a country parson and his wife and daughter. Evidently, there was some garden party going on at the abbey. The road dropped away to the right at the end of the avenue, and I could see the abbey across a wide pasturage and a broad lawn thickly dotted with guests. 
The end of the building was plain. It must have been almost mercilessly austere when it was first built. But time had crumbled the edges and toned the stone down into an orange lichened grey wherever it showed behind its curtain of magnolia, jasmine and ivy. Farther on was the three-storied Jacobean house, tall and handsome. There had not been the slightest attempt to adapt the one to the other, but the kindly ivy had glossed over the touching point. There was a tall flesh in the middle of the building, surmounting a small bell tower. Behind the house there rose the mountainous verdure of Spanish chestnuts all the way up the hill. Broughton had seen me coming from afar, and walked across from his other guests to welcome me, before turning me over to the butler's care. This man was sandy-haired and rather inclined to be talkative. He could, however, answer hardly any questions about the house. He had, he said, only been there three weeks. Mindful of what Broughton had told me, I made no inquiries about ghosts, though the room into which I was shown might have justified anything. It was a very large low room, with oak beams projecting from the white ceiling. Every inch of the walls, including the doors, was covered with tapestry, and a remarkably fine Italian four-post bedstead, heavily draped, added to the darkness and dignity of the place. All the furniture was old, well-made, and dark. Underfoot there was a plain green pile carpet. The only new thing about the room, except the electric light fittings, and the jugs and basins. Even the looking-glass on the dressing-table was an old pyramidal Venetian glass, set in a heavy repoussé frame of tarnished silver. After a few minutes cleaning up, I went downstairs and out upon the lawn where I greeted my hostess. The people gathered there were of the usual country type, all anxious to be pleased and roundly curious as to the new master of the abbey. Rather to my surprise, and quite to my pleasure, I rediscovered Glenham, whom I had known well in the old days in Barotseland. He lived quite close by, as he remarked with a grin. I ought to have known. But, he added, I don't live in a place like this. He swept his hand to the long low lines of the abbey in obvious admiration, and then, to my intense interest, muttered beneath his breath, Thank God! He saw that I had overheard him, and turning to me said decidedly, Yes, thank God, I said, and I meant it. I wouldn't live at the Abbey for all Broughton's money. But surely, I demurred, you know that old Clark was discovered in the very act of setting light to his bugaboos. Glenham shrugged his shoulders. Yes, I know about that. But there is something wrong with the place still. All I can say is that Broughton is a different man since he's lived here. I don't believe they'll remain much longer, but you're staying here. Well, you'll hear all about it tonight. There's a big dinner, I understand. The conversation turned off to old reminiscences, and Glenham soon after had to go. Before I went to dress that evening, I had twenty minutes' talk with Broughton in his library. There was no doubt the man was altered, gravely altered. He was nervous and fidgety, and I found him looking at me only when my eye was off him. I naturally asked him what he wanted of me. I told him I would do anything I could, but that I couldn't conceive what he lacked that I could provide. He said with a lustreless smile that there was, however, something, and that he would tell me the following morning. It struck me that he was somehow ashamed of himself, and perhaps ashamed of the part he was asking me to play. However, I dismissed the subject from my mind and went up to dress in my palatial room. As I shut the door, a draught blew out of the Queen of Sheba from the wall, and I noticed that the tapestries were not fastened to the wall at the bottom. I have always held very practical views about spooks, and it has often seemed to me that the slow waving in firelight of loose tapestry upon a wall would account for ninety-nine per cent of the stories one hears. Certainly the dignified undulation of this lady with her attendants and huntsmen one of whom was untidily cutting the throat of a fallow deer upon the very steps on which King Solomon, a grey-faced Flemish nobleman with the Order of the Golden Fleece, awaited his fair visitor, gave colour to my hypothesis. Nothing much happened at dinner. The people were very much like those of the garden party. 
A young woman next to me seemed anxious to know what was being read in London. As she was far more familiar than I with the most recent magazines and literary supplements, I found salvation in being myself instructed in the tendencies of modern fiction. All true art, she said, was shot through and through with melancholy. How vulgar were the attempts at wit that marked so many modern books. From the beginning of literature it had always been tragedy that embodied the highest attainment of every age. To call such works morbid merely begged the question. No thoughtful man, she looked sternly at me through the steel rim of her glasses, could fail to agree with me. Of course, as one would, I immediately and properly said that I slept with Pet Ridge and Jacobs under my pillow at night, and that if Jorrocks weren't quite so large and cornery, I would add him to the company. She hadn't read any of them, so I was saved for a time. But I remember grimly that she said that the dearest wish of her life was to be in some awful and soul-freezing situation of horror, and I remembered that she dealt hardly with the hero of Nat Painter's vampire story between nibbles at her brown bread ice. She was a cheerless soul, and I couldn't help thinking that if there were many such in the neighbourhood, it was not surprising that old Glenham had been stuffed with some nonsense or other about the Abbey. Yet nothing could well have been less creepy than the glitter of silver and glass and the subdued lights and cackle of conversation all round the dinner-table. After the ladies had gone, I found myself talking to the rural dean. He was a thin, earnest man who had once turned the conversation to old clerk's buffooneries. But, he said, Mr. Broughton had introduced such a new and cheerful spirit not only into the Abbey, but, he might say, into the whole neighbourhood, that he had great hopes that the ignorant superstition of the past were from henceforth destined to oblivion. Thereupon his other neighbour, a portly gentleman of independent means and position, audibly remarked, Amen, which dampened the rural dean, and we talked of partridges past, partridges present, and pheasants to come. At the other end of the table, Broughton sat with a couple of his friends, red-faced hunting men. Once I noticed that they were discussing me, but I paid no attention to it at the time. I remembered it a few hours later. By eleven all the guests were gone, and Broughton, his wife and I, were alone together under the fine plaster ceiling of the Jacobean drawing-room. Mrs. Broughton talked about one or two of the neighbours, and then, with a smile, said that she knew I would excuse her, shook hands with me, and went off to bed. I am not very good at analysing things, but I felt that she talked a little uncomfortably, and, with a suspicion of effort, smiled rather conventionally, and was obviously glad to go. These things seemed trifling enough to repeat, but I had throughout the faint feeling that everything was not square. Under the circumstances this was enough to set me wondering what on earth the service could be that I was to render, wondering also whether the whole business were not some ill-advised jest in order to make me come down from London for a mere shooting party. Broughton said little after she had gone, but he was evidently labouring to bring the conversation round to the so-called hauntings of the Abbey. As soon as I saw this, of course, I asked him directly about it. He then seemed at once to lose interest in the matter. There was no doubt about it. Broughton was somehow a changed man, and to my mind he had changed in no way for the better. Mrs. Broughton seemed no sufficient cause. He was clearly fond of her, and she of him. I reminded him that he was going to tell me what I could do for him in the morning, pleaded my journey, lighted a candle, and went upstairs with him. At the end of the passage leading into the old house he grinned weakly and said, Mind, if you see a ghost, do talk to it. You said you would. He stood irresolutely a moment and then turned away. At the door of his dressing-room he paused once more. I'm here, he called out, if you should want anything. Good night. And he shut his door. I went along the passage to my room, undressed, switched on a lamp beside my bed, read a few pages of the jungle book, and then, more than ready for sleep, turned the light off and went fast asleep. Three hours later I woke up. 
There was not a breath of wind outside. There was not even a flicker of light from the fireplace. As I lay there, an ash tinkled slightly as it cooled, but there was hardly a gleam of the dullest red in the grate. An owl cried among the silent Spanish chestnuts on the slope outside. I idly reviewed the events of the day, hoping that I should fall off to sleep again before I reached dinner, but at the end I seemed as wakeful as ever. There was no help for it, I must read my jungle book again till I felt ready to go off, so I fumbled for the pair at the end of the cord that hung down inside the bed, and I switched on the bedside lamp. The sudden glory dazzled me for a moment. I felt under my pillow for my book, with half-shut eyes, then, uh, growing used to the light, I happened to look down to the foot of my bed. I can never tell you really what happened then. Nothing I could ever confess in the most abject words could even faintly picture to you what I felt. I know that my heart stopped dead and my throat shut automatically. In one instinctive movement I crouched back up against the headboards of the bed staring at the horror. The movement set my heart going again, and the sweat dripped from every pore. I am not a particularly religious man, but I had always believed that God would never allow any supernatural appearance to present itself to man in such a guise and in such circumstances that harm, either bodily or mental, could result to him. I can only tell you that at that moment both my life and my reason rocked unsteadily on their seats. The other Osiris passengers had gone to bed, and only he and I remained, leaning over the starboard railing, which rattled uneasily now and then under the fierce vibration of the over-engined mailboat. Far over, there were the lights of a few fishing smacks riding out the night, and a great rush of white, combing and seething water fell out and away from us overside. At last Colvin went on, leaning over the foot of my bed, looking at me. There was a figure, swathed in a rotten and tattered veiling. This shroud passed over the head, but left both eyes and the right side of the face bare. It then followed the line of the arm down to where the hand grasped the bed end. The face was not entirely that of a skull, though the eyes and the flesh of the face were totally gone. There was a thin, dry skin drawn tightly over the features, and there was some skin left on the hand. One wisp of hair crossed the forehead. It was perfectly still. I looked at it, and it looked at me, and my brains turned dry and hot in my head. I had still got the pair of the electric lamp in my hand, and I played idly with it, only I dared not turn out the light again. I shut my eyes, only to open them in a hideous terror the same second. The thing had not moved. My heart was thumping, and the sweat cooled me as it evaporated. Another cinder tinkled in the grate, and a panel creaked in the wall. My reason failed me. For twenty minutes, or twenty seconds, I was able to think of nothing else but this awful figure, till there came, hurtling through the empty channels of my senses, the remembrance that Broughton and his friends had discussed me furtively at dinner. The dim possibility of it being a hoax stole gratefully into my unhappy mind, and once there, one's pluck came creeping back along a thousand tiny veins. My first sensation was one of blind, unreasoning thankfulness that my brain was going to stand the trial. I'm not a timid man, but the best of us needs some human handle to steady him in time of extremity. And in this faint but growing hope that after all it might only be a brutal hoax, I found the fulcrum that I needed. At last I moved. How I managed to do it I cannot tell you, but with one spring towards the foot of the bed I got within arm's length and struck out one fearful blow with my fist at the thing. 
It crumbled under it. My hand was cut to the bone. With the sickening revulsion after my terror, I dropped half-fainting across the end of the bed. So it was merely a foul trick after all. No doubt the trick had been played many a time before. No doubt Broughton and his friends had had some large bet among themselves as to what I should do when I discovered the gruesome thing. From my state of abject terror I found myself transported into an insensate anger. I shouted curses upon Broughton. I dived rather than climbed over the bed-end onto the sofa. I tore at the robed skeleton. How well the whole thing had been carried out, I thought. I broke the skull against the floor and stamped upon its dry bones. I flung the head away under the bed and rent the brittle bones of the trunk in pieces. I snapped the thin thigh bones across my knee and flung them in different directions. The shin bones I set up against a stool and broke them with my heel. I raged like a berserker against the loathly thing and stripped the ribs from the backbone and slung the breastbone against the cupboard. My fury increased as the work of destruction went on. I tore the frail rotten veil into twenty pieces, and the dust went up over everything, over the clean blotting paper and the silver inkstand. At last my work was done. There was but a raffle of broken bones and strips of parchment and crumbling wool. Then, picking up a piece of the skull, it was the cheek and temple bone of the right side, I remember, I opened the door and went down the passage to Broughton's dressing room. I remember still how my sweat-dripping pyjamas clung to me as I walked. At the door I kicked and entered. Broughton was in bed. He had already turned the light on and seemed shrunken and horrified. For a moment he could hardly pull himself together. Then I spoke. I don't know what I said. Only I know that from a heart full and overfull with hatred and contempt, spurred on by shame of my own recent cowardice, I let my tongue run on. He answered nothing. I was amazed at my own fluency. My hair still clung lankily to my wet temples. My hand was bleeding profusely, and I must have looked a strange sight. Broughton huddled himself up at the end of the bed, just as I had. Still he made no answer, no defence. He seemed preoccupied with something beside my reproaches, and once or twice moistened his lips with his tongue. But he could say nothing, though he moved his hands now and then, just as a baby who cannot speak moves its hands. At last the door into Mrs. Broughton's room opened, and she came in, white and terrified. What is it? What is it? Oh, in God's name, what is it? She cried again and again, and then she went up to her husband and sat on the bed in her nightdress, and the two faced me. I told her what the matter was. I spared her husband not a word for her presence there, yet he seemed hardly to understand. I told the pair that I had spoiled their cowardly joke for them. Broughton looked up. I have smashed the foul thing into a hundred pieces, I said. Broughton licked his lips again, and his mouth worked. By God, I shouted, it would serve you right if I thrashed you within an inch of your life. I will take care that not a decent man or woman of my acquaintance ever speaks to you again. And there, I added, throwing the broken piece of the skull upon the floor beside his bed, there is a souvenir for you of your damned work tonight. Broughton saw the bone, and in a moment it was his turn to frighten me. He squealed like a hare caught in a trap. He screamed and screamed till Mrs. Broughton, almost as bewildered as myself, held on to him and coaxed him like a child to be quiet. But Broughton, and as he moved I thought that ten minutes ago I perhaps looked as terribly ill as he did, thrust her from him, and scrambled out of the bed onto the floor, and still screaming, put out his hand to the bone. It had blood on it from my hand. He paid no attention to me, whatever. In truth, I said nothing. This was a new turn indeed to the horrors of the evening. He rose from the floor with the bone in his hand and stood silent. He seemed to be listening. Time, time, perhaps, he muttered, and almost at the same moment fell at full length on the carpet, cutting his head against the fender. 
The bone flew from his hand and came to rest near the door. I picked Broughton up, haggard and broken, with blood over his face. He whispered hoarsely and quickly, Listen, listen. We listened. After ten seconds utter quiet, I seemed to hear something. I could not be sure, but at last there was no doubt. There was a quiet sound as of one moving along the passage. Little regular steps came towards us over the hard oak flooring. Broughton moved to where his wife sat, white and speechless on the bed, and pressed her face into his shoulder. Then the last thing that I could see as he turned the light out, he fell forward with his own head pressed into the pillow of the bed. Something in their company, something in their cowardice helped me, and I faced the open doorway of the room, which was outlined fairly clearly against the dimly lighted passage. I put out one hand and touched Mrs. Broughton's shoulder in the darkness. But at the last moment, I too failed. I sank on my knees and put my face in the bed. Only we all heard. The footsteps came to the door, and there they stopped. The piece of bone was lying a yard inside the room. There was a rustle of moving stuff and the thing was in the room. Mrs. Broughton was silent. I could hear Broughton's voice praying, muffled in the pillow. I was cursing my own cowardice. Then the steps moved out again on the oak boards of the passage, and I heard the sounds dying away. In a flash of remorse I went to the door and looked out. At the end of the corridor I thought I saw something that moved away. A moment later the passage was empty. I stood with my forehead against the jamb of the door, almost physically sick. Y you can turn the light on, I said, and there was an answering flare. Uh, there was no bone at my feet. Mrs. Broughton had fainted. Broughton was almost useless, and it took me ten minutes to bring her to. Broughton only said one such thing worth remembering. For the most part he went on muttering prayers, but I was glad afterwards to recollect that he had said that thing. He said in a colourless voice, half as a question, half as a reproach, you didn't speak to her. We spent the remainder of the night together. Mrs. Broughton actually fell off into a kind of sleep before dawn, but she suffered so horribly in her dreams that I shook her to consciousness again. Never was dawn so long in coming. Three or four times Broughton spoke to himself, Mrs. Broughton would just then tighten her hold on his arm, but she could say nothing. As for me, I can honestly say that I grew worse as the hours passed and the light strengthened. The two violent reactions had battered down my steadiness of view, and I felt that the foundations of my life had been built upon the sand. I said nothing, and after binding up my hand with a towel, I didn't move. It was better so. They helped me, and I helped them, and we all three knew that our reason had gone very near to ruin that night. At last, when the light came in pretty strongly, and the birds outside were chattering and singing, we felt that we must do something. Yet we never moved. You might have thought that we should particularly dislike being found as we were by the servants, yet nothing of that kind mattered a straw and an overpowering listlessness bound us as we sat, until Chapman, Broughton's man, actually knocked and opened the door. None of us moved. Broughton, speaking hardly and stiffly, said, Chapman, you can come back in five minutes. Chapman was a discreet man, but it would have made no difference to us if he had carried his news to the room at once. We looked at each other, and I said I must go back. I meant to wait outside till Chapman returned. I simply dared not re-enter my bedroom alone. Broughton roused himself and said that he would come with me. Mrs. Broughton agreed to remain in her own room for five minutes if the blinds were drawn up and all the doors left open. So Broughton and I, leaning stiffly one against the other, went down to my room. By the morning light that filtered past the blinds we could see our way, and I released the blinds. 
There was nothing wrong in the room from end to end, except smears of my own blood, on the end of the bed, on the sofa, and on the carpet, where I had torn the thing to pieces. Colvin had finished his story. There was nothing to say. Seven bells stuttered out from the forecastle, and the answering cry wailed through the darkness. I took him downstairs. Of course, I'm much better now. But it is a kindness of you to let me sleep in your cabin. Everybody dies, don't they? Everybody so come back, don't they? Isn't that so? You tried to get into the locked room so? today, didn't you? you tried How to do the dead come back, Mother? Didn't you? What's the secret? So this is the part of the podcast when I talk about the story. If you're new to this podcast, I do this every episode. I will recite the story, then I'll talk about it, about the author, and give my um, my thoughts about it and my response to the story. Now, I know that some people don't like that, just want to hear stories. So I have created long playlists on YouTube um, that are just compilations of stories for hours and hours. There are also, there's also a playlist called Full Audio Books, and many of these are eight to nine hours long. So you can get lots of stories with no commentaries there if that is your preference. If you do uh, enjoy, and I know many of you do enjoy reflecting upon the story along with me, then please stay along for the ride. Remember, if you have uh, the wherewithal and you don't like ads you can become a patron and I think for five dollars a month you can get the whole library which I keep on my Google Drive and you can download that and you can do what you like with the stories and there's no ads on those uh, there are commentaries on them so the solution for people who don't like commentaries is the long the compilation playlists the solution for people who don't like ads is become a patron so www.patreon.com forward slash Barkid, B-A-R-C-U-D. Now we'll talk about this story, Thernley Abbey, by Percival Landon. To put the author into his context, he was an English writer, traveller and journalist, born on March 29th, 1869 in Hastings uh, in Kent. Uh, is Hastings in Kent? Oh, just You know what, there's those things, you, you doubt yourself, don't you? I think it is. It might be in Sussex, but I think it's in Kent. Somebody's going to tell me. He was educated at Forest School and Hartford College, Oxford, where he developed a lifelong interest in heraldry and served as the secretary of the Oxford Union, which is the great debating body, of course. So um, the heraldry is interesting because he actually references it in this story, doesn't he? Um, he talks about his man, Colvin, and he talks about the abbey with with the heraldic beasts on the pillars as you go in. And clearly he couldn't help himself, but uh, just give a little mensch to something he's interested in. I do that in my own stories as well. Uh, so uh, after university, Landon was called to the bar, so he became barrister by the Inner Temple at the Inner Temple and soon transitioned to journalism. So he spent all that money and then decided to become a journalist. I'm not sure anybody would do that these days. He gained prominence as a war correspondent for the Times during the South African War uh, and later travelled extensively in the Middle East and Central Asia, including participating in the British expedition to Tibet, 1903-1904, which he documented in his well-known non-fiction work, The Opening of Tibet. Landon also penned a collection of short stories titled Raw Edges, which includes his most celebrated and frequently... Excuse me. Excuse me. So what's happening here is... Um, I. I do interject some real life things into these commentaries sometimes and I know a lot of people really like that so I keep doing it. If you're not one of those people I'm really sorry but you can't please everybody can you? So uh, that's the dogs and what's happened has been I record the story with them not here and they're locked away and then I feel really guilty because I'm, 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 they're, um, they're downstairs and so I open the door and they come up and little Callie has been up here being a very good girl and then Jasper's come up, he's been asleep and he is now woken up and full of life and he's annoying her. <coughs> and she's very upset with him. And then Ruby's come and just pack it. It's your, this, is, this is dog's fear. So it's his own fault. It's his own fault. He's annoying her. So Jasper is now frightened and he's sitting with me so his sister can't get him. Um, and I might have to have a little break to sort this out. No, he's, he's worried about He's coming to cuddle against me. You leave him alone now. I know he annoyed you, but... 
You've made your point, okay? You've made your point, Callie, okay? There we are. We appear to have some kind of truce now. So we've been out for about four and a half miles this morning and we'll be going out later on. It's a bit too hot at the moment. It's amazing to say that, isn't it? I mean, I'm only talking about it's about 24 degrees, which is no big deal for most countries. 24 degrees centigrade. I don't know what that is in American. Um, 60 something, I think. I actually don't know. But but there we are. So you would have thought they've had a sleep since we've come in and I took that time to record Thurnley Abbey. Now, because it's sunny outside and this room's really hot, I've had the windows open. And I don't know if you've heard, there's been young lads on motorbikes outside because there's a park behind us. And so they're taking advantage of the nice weather. And you may have heard that in the recording, motorbikes, and I almost despaired of finishing it because they kept doing it. I had to stop loads of times. I... It was almost at the point of going out and throwing eggs at them uh, and telling them to jolly well clear off. They don't talk like that around here, mind, so they wouldn't know what I was talking about. But, um, but uh, yeah, so we, we got there in the end, and I hope it's not too audible. I'm sorry for that interjection. I know some of you quite like these real-life things. So, um, yeah, so where were we? He was, he died um, when he was 58, this is Percival Landon. He was a great, clearly a great imperialist. He was a, a son of the British Empire, and he was a big, uh, a big close pal of Rudyard Kipling. So Thurnley Abbey was first published in 1908 as part of, part of his only collection of short stories, which was called Raw Edges, good title. The story quickly distinguished itself as a standout piece within the volume, revered for its chilling atmosphere and psychological depth. It was met with acclaim and found resonance with readers and fellow writers alike, and even the master of ghost stories, M.R. James, described it as almost too horrid. So that's great praise indeed. Um, although um, he doesn't, M.R. James elsewhere, doesn't like nasty ghosts. Uh, he doesn't like uh, vulgar ghosts, I don't think. But there we are. So it's, it's a canon. I've never done it before. When you check on YouTube, which I inevitably do once I've decided to record it, you see 1,400 people have done it. But um, I wanted to do it, and so I did. What is it about it? So I think, what can we say that's familiar? First of all, this frame story idea is such a staple of late Victorian and early Edwardian ghost stories. You meet somebody who tells you a ghost story, and I believe this is a deliberate technique, which to us these days seems redundant. Why do that? But I think there was a feeling, and probably if they'd gone to creative writing classes in their day, they would have been told to do this. M.R. James himself says, create distance between... We've got to remember that the late 19th century and early 20th century were hyper-realist, hyper-rationalist. You know, it seemed that science was going to uh, show that everything was living in this mechanistic, unspiritual um, worldview. And although um, religion, particularly in England and Wales and Scotland and Ireland, um, was still strong. I mean, we're going to leave Ireland out of that and maybe leave Wales out of that. Yeah, I think Scotland and England uh, was still strong and um, it, it was waning. And so realism and physics and all this, Newtonian physics, this is before Einstein, before quantum theory, before the ghost came back into the machine. Uh, it was just like we were living in this machine and the ghosts weren't really real, were they? And, you know, um, clever people in the upper echelons of society kind of who read books, people who read books, Although we have, we've also spoken about Varney, and um, which is slightly earlier, obviously, about sixty years earlier, um, and the the literate working classes. But this is this is these kind of stories were written for middle class people with leisure. Uh, ah, you know, I'm not. This is not a criticism. It's just a, a vague description. So they have to. M. R. James says create distance, so it becomes more believable. I remember Tolkien writing a little bit later than this talks about the suspension of disbelief as if your average reader was, isn't going to believe this at all i think we've moved on tremendously i think our storytelling is so saturated with fantasy and science fiction and horror that realist stories are actually um in the minority usually they're crime stories actually realist stories but we've abandoned that but for them 
and this is a long way of saying it, this frame device was probably seen as necessary to create the distance so the story became a little bit more believable. After saying that, I particularly liked, and I wondered if it was drawn from his own experience, this, you know, you're going to go to Brindisi, you're going to the East, as you always do, and you're going to catch the train across Europe, and you're going to lounge around reading novels on the Ottoman uh, Express, the, uh, and um, the, what's it called? The Orient Express, uh, and that doesn't that sound super cool? And you catch the mail boat from Brindisi and it's the Osiris and it's going to drop you in Egypt and then from there you're going to make your way to the east. Uh, and uh, it sounds really cool. And I'm... <laughs> I've just opened a can of worms there. Some people are going, oh, colonizers. Or oh. I'm not even talking about that, okay? I'm just talking about the individual. How can you just talk about the individual? No, I am. I really am. I really am. Uh, I realise if there's some people awake, asleep there, they've just woken up. Um... The dogs probably woke them up, to be fair. So I thought it was cool. I liked that, that that life, which is not ours. It's so romantic and leisured, and it's not ours, is it? We go to work and uh, and uh, have to make ends meet in the cost of living crisis. But, you know, they could uh, do that lounge on the Orient Express as it travelled across Europe reading yellowed paperback and sitting in the dining cars, talking to gentlemen who were members of White's Club. Um, how splendid. Anyway, I got lost in the frame. And then the real story is a, is also at a distance. It's yeah, it's sort of it's a friend of his. I mean, he is the protagonist Colvin. He experiences these things. So, the abbey itself, ah, oh, your classic gothic. Let's bring it in, the classic gothic edifice. It's like something from the Castle of Otranto, isn't it? Walled up nuns. Come on. This is pure 1790 gothic. And, and no worse for that. I like me a, a dollop of gothic. So um, I think, and, and so Landon does that really well. One thing I want to say is that in early ghost literature, think about M.R. James, think about or Edwardian ghost literature and earlier stuff, Mrs. Gaskell and, you know, um, what we have is the ghosts appear and there is no real physical interaction they are scary but you know you don't really touch them you don't you don't fight them and and so i thought this was rather rather special and very modern because of course later on this idea of fighting if you were going to write a book now and you had a ghost in it that you fought it becomes a dungeons and dragons story it becomes a fantasy story isn't it uh, at best, a Call of Cthulhu story, you know, you are going to be blasting away and punching and shooting and stuff. It's a different genre altogether now. Uh, and in modern horror, it, as modern horror came on, the ghosts became more physical or the monsters became more physical and could do you physical harm. Whereas in earlier stories, generally, they were just, they just did you psychological harm. They were scary, you know. And I think in the early days, they weren't even psychological. They were just scary. And then they, we get the M.R. James psychological era from t Turn of the Screw, not M.R. James, Henry James from the Turn of the Screw. And then we get like modern horror. And then we, and this evolves into sort of books of blood, Clive Barker type stuff um, in late, cent late 20th century. So I think it's a very interesting evolution. And I think this is in the fact he actually batters the skeleton and it's visceral, it's, it's physical, is fresh and new. That's what I think. And would have been seen and felt as such. And I think probably that's one of the reasons why this has resonated. Why has this story resonated? What did the... So I can only examine my own feelings towards it. And I said I really did like the idea of this meeting, you know, the, the travel across Europe, this very gentrified, leisured life that we would have l l liked to lead, you know. Uh, that's nice. It's like the Shire in... Uh, Lord of the Rings, isn't it? Or Lorien. Uh, they're lovely places we'd like to visit. This is a life we'd like to visit. Forget the horror. This is what we... So that's number one. The second is the gothicness of the Abbey. If you like this kind of story, probably you like a bit of gothic like me. You may even dress in black and wear heavy makeup and have a skull um, on your bedside table and drink red wine out of crystal goblets. You may be full goth. You may go to Whitby Goth Weekend. Uh, and why not? I'm, uh, that's always appealed to me, but I've been a bit scared of the full dress-up in case I look vaguely ludicrous. 
um, which possibly I might. The closest I got to being a goth was going to see uh, Fields of the Nephilim in Brixton in the 80s when I dyed my hair black. And it was pretty black anyway. Uh, it went sort of blue-black. I told this story before and everybody laughed at me at work and they only told me when it had grown out how everybody was stifling their laughter behind their hands in the office canteen. Um, but so I think the Gothic of the Abbey, I think the nice life that they lead. And then I think the other thing that he does really well. I thought it was really well written. I thought technically the the, the prose was very good. Um, this is a man who, he's a journalist as well. This is a man who knew how to deploy his language. But the the appearance and particularly the approach of the nun to collect her broken skull that she has gone missing, and he absolutely scandalously takes it with him. She does not like that. He she comes, and the sense of her being outside in the corridor, the sense of her in the dark coming in. I've got to admit, if you listen to my own stories, I make um, extensive use of that. In my stories, there's lots of people sitting in rooms where something approaches from outside and uh, it is a really effective technique and if you draw it out sometimes people say to me will you have a look at this story and remember I I'm not saying I'm not an expert in these things I'm a practitioner and I'm a reader and a practitioner of writing I'm not saying you know I'm clearly not being honored with many awards and stuff like that so I'm just saying what I think okay with that said People say to me, what do you think? And very often what writers do who show me their work is they don't milk it. So, you know, uh, it's almost like they're embarrassed. If you have a, there's some kind of rule of thumb, the more important a scene is, the more words you should spend on it. So if you want to create this build up of dread you need to spend your words rather than rushing over it. it's like uh, you know and the figure approached from outside and they opened the door and there it was and he picked up the skull and went away no 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 the steps the dread milk it milk it milk it milk it it works it works there are technical things that work and you may think that this um this is a whole different ball game isn't it about artifice there is artifice in writing um and there is a technicality, same way as there's a technicality to building a wall, or there's technicality to composing music, there's technicality to dance, there's technicality to um, painting. You know, of course there's technicality to writing. I think, again, you'll have heard me go on about this. We had this idea that the Romantics come up with uh, in the you know, sort of late 18th, 19th centuries, whereby we, we produced from the muse, from inspiration, and, and we just pass what comes up through us and no artifice and that kind of sullies it and it is ungentlemanly. It is the, the amateur, not the professional. There's this dichotomy that we have between the two whereby, particularly, you know, in those days, the, the, there was the tradesman was looked down on, the gentleman who, the Byronesque gentleman, who spoke from his heart and his spirit and was a free spirit that was prized and technicalities were frowned upon and sneered at actually but let's get away from that we're not living in 1880 now or 1860 or even 1920 what we have now is there are ways of writing things that are effective and uh, study rhetoric do it. Um, learn how to write that way. This guy knew how to do it. He was a professional. And, and and I think so, in summary, is those are the elements that make this a memorable story. Remember, that's my opinion. I am not special. I just read and write ghost stories. And so uh, I'm interested in them. And that's the level I'm giving you this talk on. Um, I don't pretend to be any greater than that. So, But if you enjoy it, and many of you do, um, and it, that helps me because it helps me earn a living. And that's fantastic. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Um, it was a goodie. It was a, it was a real goodie, part of the canon. Uh, should have done it ages ago. Everybody dies, don't they? Everybody come back. Isn't that so? Isn't that so?